Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Profiling the Cell Surface of Cancer Cell Lines for Biomarker Drug Target Discovery Using MS-Based Proteomics, presented by Josip Blonder, MD, Senior Scientist, Cancer Research Technology Program, Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left of the corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Blonder. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Dr. Blonder, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. So in this presentation, I will shortly explain what mass spectrometry-based proteomics is. I will talk about molecular profiling of biological specimens and uh, focus on membrane and cell surface proteins. After that, we'll be talking about cancer biomarker and drug discovery and show through a couple of applications and finish up with conclusions and further directions. Liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, also known as shotgun proteomics, is an analytical tool where proteins are digested into the triptych peptide with trypsin and analyzed using reverse phase chromatography followed by processing and identification of proteins. Uh, mass spectrometry based proteomics has certain challenges like any omics technology. However, ours are the major issue with the proteomics is that we don't have a luxury as genomics to amplify every protein. So the dynamic range and uh, abundant proteins are an issue which should be addressed properly. So the dynamic range issue is um, very important because in, for example, in a plasma or serum, the concentration range, uh, dynamic range of protein concentration is about 10 to 11, while current mass spectrometry spectrometers have dynamic range of maybe six to seven. So that gap should be properly addressed because the most probably the proteins that we are looking for are not housekeeping proteins, they are biomarker and drug targets which have lower abundance. Therefore, there are different ways how to address the dynamic range in, in a mass spectrometry-based proteomics. Uh, most, the most common way of doing it is to do subcellular fractionation in a terms of uh, uh, enriching for kind of like a plasma membrane, mitochondria, nuclei, if you are focused on that so that the, the rest of the subcellular proteome is eliminated or use different kind of separation techniques like electrophoresis, SDS page, 2D page, capillary electrophoresis, or use different kind of fractionation techniques like reverse phase or ion exchange, a strong ion exchange. Also, an old way was also the MS-based fractionation that we are looking into the M over Z fractionation, focusing on the smaller M over Z range to generate the, the depth. 
any of these is good, but it, it is definitely important to figure out and find out which one of those is the best to use given the analytical uh, or proteomic sample we are looking into. In our laboratory, we use strong cation exchange fractionation, which is similar to mud pit, but we are doing it offline. So we take the digestate and do strong cation exchange fractionation uh, offline, and then run each fraction on the on the on the mass spec. The importance of this slide is to see here that we can load almost just five micrograms of the peptide and see how our gradient looks like. Is are we happy with the fractionation? And then we do injection, analytical injection, which is represent in the blue, uh, uh, showing each of these fraction, and we, those fractions are collected in uh, 96 wells. Each fraction then can be analyzed uh, uh, separately, and then uh, after that collate collated and uh, run through the sequester and, and any kind of algorithm that will give you the final protein uh, identification. So let, next thing, what we are going to talk about uh, membrane proteins, because membrane proteins are difficult to solubilize. Uh, the best thing to, for to solubilize them when it, we are not talking about mass spectrometry is uh, using detergent, but detergents are detrimental to the separation, so there, are, there should be some other ways how to look into the solubilization of membrane proteins. Uh, we have used organic solvent-based system and combined with the uh, strong cation extractionation, and here is the paper that we have published a couple years ago looking into the lipid rafts of uh, lipid rafts of cells which are treated with IOTA B and uh, with the vehicle. Basically, the major focus of that study was to find out what are the proteins that are associated at the cell surface and internalizing IOTA B toxin into the cell line. There we have used uh, strong cation exchange fractionation coupled with uh, lipid draft uh, isolation using uh, density gradients, and also we have used uh, O18 or 16 differential labeling to compare control with IOTA B treated, treated cells. Uh, in a short, we came out and we published a paper with a, with a group of proteins that are, that are most likely differently uh, regulated, and we have really focused on CD44 as, as a potential target uh, and uh, market among the others as the one which be a facilitator of uh, internalization of IOTA B toxin into the, into the cells. Um, long, <laughs> almost five years after, the group, the our collaborator, after a lot of uh, molecular biology, after a lot of uh, uh, experiments using in vivo, uh, and uh, experiments, uh, they have confirmed our result and published a paper that's showing that IOTA B is uh, really um, uh, helped or facilitated by CD44, and then we see that uh, CD44 uh, knocked cells are, are showing less of uh, of IOTA B toxin Y C D forty four plus cells are showing a, a lot of it. So, so that is one of the examples to show how uh, global proteomics can be used. Shotgun proteomics can be used to figure out what are the proteins that are helping internalization of IOTA B toxin, and then if those those proteins on the cell surface can be blocked, most probably the internalization of a deadly IOTA B toxin will be uh, uh, mediated. So here is a paper that has been uh, published based on our initial uh, study, and this illustrates the power of global quantitative proteomics employed in discovery phase. And it was followed, obviously, with cross-validation and uh, uh, using specific molecular biology 
techniques. Uh, so that was the kind of intro into the uh, biomarker and drug target discovery. And now I would like to just uh, say a couple of words, why do we need biomarkers? So the only biomarker until now and the most, the most of the studies is, is the famous Kaplan-Meier survival curve, which, if, which shows if we treat the animals or the humans with the some drug, whether the survival is longer. So that tells us only that some drug is effective, but what the nature of that uh, effectiveness is, is not known. And the other things, these are the results which are really uh, collected using a multiple subjects and that would be applied to a single subject with, a, with a, for example, cancer, which uh, most likely is not going to be, we do know that it doesn't work all the time. So if we have a group of patients with the same diagnosis and the uh, same cancer, we can see that if we just use coupler mind curves and apply the, 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 the treatment, there are basically four different effects that out of those four, three are not important because we, we can have that the drug is not toxic but not beneficial. Drug can be toxic, although beneficial cannot be used. Uh, drug can be also toxic and not beneficial, which is the worst. And uh, so drug is not toxic and beneficial, and that is uh, basically the only outcome that we are interested in. However, if we don't have biomarkers, we don't know uh, or we can prevent people who might not benefit from a patient, we not benefit from that treatment that is not going to be enrolled in it at all. So the one of the, of the major um, biomarkers, it was the first one is discovered, is Herceptin in a breast cancer, and breast cancer is most probably 10 years about, ahead of all the other cancers. So that is an ideal situation where uh, uh, immunohistochemistry is, is done, and uh, we see that, uh, that the patient tumor expresses HER2, and then Herceptin can be uh, applied. If the, the tumor is not HER2 positive, obviously, then the, the, the treatment is obsolete and someone should not be uh, exposed to unnecessary and expensive treatment. So that is a basically an intro in, in precision medicine and why, what is the precision medicine. There are many of uh, uh, definition. I, I prefer this one. Precision or personalized medicine is an emerging approach for disease treatment, treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle of each person. Um, and definition, what is a biomarker? Biomarker is a biological molecule or panel of molecules found in the blood, other body fluid, or tissue that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indica indicator of physiological or pathological process or response to therapeutic intervention. So uh, one of the, our major uh, efforts in uh, Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research is the uh, RAS program, which is trying to uh, find the way how to attack RAS-driven cancers. RAS-driven cancers are the biggest killers, and 90% uh, of uh, pancreatic cancer has mutated RAS protein, and about 40% of lung cancer and uh, uh, colon cancer are also mutated. So that is an, a big initiative, looking into the RAS mutants and uh, trying to uh, improve the treatment of RAS driven cancer. Our, um, uh, the initiative that our group is, is, is working is, is uh, RAS cell surface and then from this now I'm going to talk about our efforts in, in that arena. So what we have taken into the, into the in, in, in what, what our role in, in the research of the, uh, in the RAS initiative is to look at the cell surface targets 
that might be different between uh, expressed between the KRAS uh, mutant cells, so I mean the cells or tumors which are expressing mutants versus those ones which are expressing wild type. So to, to address that issue, we have basically combined two techniques. The first one is uh, cell surface technology published by Abersol's group where the sodium periodate is used to oxidize um, uh, gly glycans, turn them to aldehyde, and then uh, using the hydrazide chemistry, we are binding only the peptides that are uh, glycosylated and washing out the peptides which are not glycosylated. So basically, enriching the cell surface of the uh, glycosylated proteins. Uh, why, did, why glycosylation? Because 90% of cell surface proteins are glycosylated. So basically, we are taking, and Abersol group has taken the advantage of, of, um, of the glycosylation pattern of the cell surface to explore uh, and to put it into the context of the proteomics to identify cell surface proteins uh, on, the, on the surface of cancer cells. We combine that with our approach that we have developed previously. We're using shotgun proteomics, so you're familiar with this slide. We fractionate the, the cell surface and we fractionate the membrane prep and then look into the fractions so to to cast a wide net. So we basically have two orthogonal methods. Uh, glycoproteomics is casting deep net and uh, uh, strong cation exchange based global membrane proteomics is casting wide net. So basically combination of those two should, uh, should give us the best insight into the, into the cell surface. Uh, we have published for last year and uh, uh, that was the the, the publication which came in on where we have uh, been uh, we, we reported our our findings first we started with uh, we use a model cell line which is MCF10A uh, it is a breast cancer cell line why we have used MCF10A cell line because that is the only cell that is spontaneously mortalized all other cells which are artificially mortalized they are very uh, very close to cancer cell line. So in, uh, in this slide, it, it is obvious that this is MCF10A empty vector transfected with empty vector. It looks like a normal epithelial cell line uh, with like a cobalt stone. And then we have seen what is happening to the cell line once it is uh, transfected with the uh, potent or cogenic KRAS mutants. You, you, the electron microscopy shows a really a transformed aggressive cells ready to move. Also, what we also have shown, we can see that the, uh, these uh, transformed cells are also creating uh, the spheres, which is the, really a sign of uh, stemness or mesenchymal and to uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. Also, before we apply the, 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 the mass spectrometry-based proteomics, we have characterized uh, these cell lines with the phenotypic cancer cell assays. So we have used uh, migration assay, oncology dependent assay, and invasion assay. All the assays came positive, showing that, uh, that really uh, cells which are transfected with the KRAS are, are showing aggressive behavior in the terms of uh, anchorage independent assay and migration assays too. So this is our experimental design. So what I told you in the beginning, basically we have taken the uh, targeted cell surface proteomics to analyze uh, cell surface of these cells using glycoproteomics. And then we have used our global proteomics strong cation exchange base and collate the data and wanted to see what is the difference between cell surface of cells expressing KRAS mutant versus empty vector transfected, transfected cells. In this analysis of the glycoproteomic analysis, we have 
found that uh, 62 proteins are unique to KRAS surface, 86 proteins are common, and 36 are found only on, uh, on the normal cells or empty vectors and spectral cells. So that was encouraging. However, that was just the beginning of uh, our bioinformatic processing. We look then into the protein class analysis in pathway signaling. And uh, an interesting thing here is that in pathway signaling, uh, integrin signaling, it was much higher into the KRAS cells and cadherin signaling and wind, wind signaling. All of those signalings are characteristic of transformed cells and these, these signals are amplified in transformed cells. Next, we use ingenuity pathways to look what are the, 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 the most abundant uh, networks of the proteins based on uh, significance, statistical significance, and number of uh, identified proteins. So when we look into then glycosylated proteins, the, the most uh, amplified or most enriched uh, network were cellular movement, cancer cellular movement, and again, again movement. So all of those IPA, uh, ingenuity pathway, uh, biological processes annotation are pointing to the cells that are ready to move, to invade, or to metastasize. And uh, uh, then, obviously, we have decided and selected the proteins for cross-validation using uh, immunofluorescence or Western blot. So we have decided to look into the CDCP1, PTPRJ, and the other proteins, and we'll show, I will show shortly how we have validated that. So this is the same representation of these networks showing the proteins that are identified, that are selected by ingenuity pathways. Those in the purple are show that are only identified in, uh, in, on the cell surface of the KRAS mutant cells, and those in the purple are shown that they are upregulated uh, in, 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 in these cells. So next, we have used the, the confocal microscopy and showing, for example, that uh, CDCP1 is uh, uh, very much uh, located in lamellipodia of MCFNA KRAS cells as MCMM2. We, we have seen that empty vector doesn't show that kind of the staining. And uh, we also show this for the PD, PTPRJ. Another network is network which is, uh, is looking into the cancer movement. Uh, different proteins are here. Basigene CD147 is, in, is important. Protein CD44. And then we have shown uh, edification, uh, validation of certain targets. We selected CD147 and PROCR and the, the mic uh, microscopic uh, imaging uh, is showing uh, positive uh, verification of the of proteomic data. So we first, then we next decided to focus on CD147, which is basigen, because we have seen by immunofluorescence that that protein is really uh, located on the cell surface of the of the cells, showing uh, in lamellipodia. Uh, particularly uh, high expression. And lamellipodia are the uh, part of the organelles of the cells which make cells moving. Obviously, that signal is absent in, uh, in, in the empty vector. So what we next wanted to know, so this is, this is an artificial system. That would be a really a, a good critic to say, okay, that cell is overflown with overexpressed with MC at the, uh, with the KRAS G12V mutant. So can we see what is happening with the, with the, with the cells that are endogenously expressing that uh, uh, KRAS mutant? So basically, we look into the lung cancer cell line, which is uh, H244 lung cancer cell line. Then we look into the pancreatic cancer cell line and the colon cancer cell line. All of those cell lines are expressing 
CD147 endogenously. So they are not manipulated. And even colon cancer cell line shows uh, spheres which are also showing very strong signal on CD147. So we are excited about that, and we figured out that CD147 can really be an important uh, molecule in the context of uh, KRAS G12V uh, mutants. Next we, next, we have look also into the CDCP1. So CDCP1 is another protein which we have found uh, uh, upregulated on the, on the cell surface of KRAS cells. And when we use the very high resolution uh, microscopy, we can see that these proteins are even co-localized on the cell surface of the, of the, of the, of the cells and trying to see is there any link between those two, two proteins. We further um, moved and, and look into the, to, together with the actin, and we have found out that CD147 and CDCP1 uh, are actually organized along the actin uh, filaments in the membrane, making that kind of the uh, complex, complex very important for the biology of uh, MCF10A cells transfected or, or transfected with, with KRAS G12V. We also found uh, an we, we also have found an, an interesting uh, uh, feature of the MCF10A KRAS G12V cells when we see that the actin is really mobilized to the to the cell surface uh, rather rather than to the in, than uh, just polymerized inside the cells. So that is another interesting finding in conjunction with the uh, redistribution of the actin filament in the transformed cells. Then we looked into the. Those are the data that we got with the glycoproteomics. Next, we look into the data which we got with the global proteomics, and the first of the network and reached there was uh, embryonic development. And we do know very well that uh, cancer cells and during the tumorigenesis, very, a lot of embryonic uh, programs get hijacked and activated where well, shouldn't be uh, really in, in, uh, in the matured cells. So we have found that the uh, antrax receptor has been upregulated into the in uh, KRAS G12V cells. And when we look in the upstream analysis at, at the regulator effect analysis, we found out that uh, uh, proteins that we identified are very much uh, linked to the KRAS uh, G12V biology. Also, we, we found that the uh, regulator effect is, is one of the major regulator of, of, of this uh, transformation is TGF beta. So when we combine all, all the data from both of the, uh, of the uh, analysis using global membrane proteomics and uh, glycoproteomics, we find out that uh, 300 proteins are unique to the KRAS G12V, uh, uh, G12V surface, and this is out of 1,300 proteins that we have identified. So basically, we, we are able to, to make a map of the proteins uh, to map the cell surface of KRAS G12V cell line. And uh, Panther classification, like for the glycoproteomics, has given us a better insight into the, uh, into the pathway amplification in this cell line. And uh, after that, we, we did the same uh, exercise. We look into the cell surface uh, proteins, uh, how they are, what are the the most uh, abundant or most activated uh, protein networks are. So looking at the global membrane proteomics, cellular movement and cancer are again drug metabolism and cellular movement invasion. 
and formation of cellular protrusions, which is really important because we have seen those protrusions on the on the in well uh, in transformed in transformed cells. Here are the proteins that we were able to uh, to cross validate using uh, immunofluorescence. Catherine four Wangel and CLSR are uh, very much uh, expressed on the cell surface of transformed cancer cell line besides ABCA2, CLC97, and XPR1 and TGBR2. Uh, also, up next, we have found also that um, the coverage of the RAS pathway was really remarkable setting and also we have seen, we have also been able to identify uh, a, a higher expression of SOS2, KRAS, and RAS and HRAS, which is uh, an interesting thing and uh, Barsagi group has shown before that uh, KRAS is not the only protein that drives the tumorigenesis that N and HRAS are also unmutated, are important for uh, transformation of uh, these cells. So what we have uh, done, we have basically defined a non-redundant surface map of KRAS G12V uh, cells, uh, and uh, we have used both uh, cell surface technology and uh, uh, global membrane proteomics. So this analysis revealed a complement of 500 non-redundant surface protein species detected uh, and uniquely, we found 30, 300 proteins found only on uh, uh, on the cell surface of KRAS G3B transport cells, and 195 proteins that are regulated. Out of 308 non-redundant protein species identified solely on the KRAS G3B surface, 177, 55 percent, 57 percent were authentic glycoproteins cataloged by. Uh, cell surface protein atlas. The remainder of 131 proteins uh, were annotated by Ingenuity pathway database as genuine cell surface proteins. So basically, what well, that is a really a, a, a benefit of using both of those because we are seeing glycoproteins and non-glycosylated protein at the cell surface. Amongst 100 non non 195 non-redundant cell surface proteins, we have found that a total of 89 we are cell surface proteins cataloged by the uh, cell surface protein atlas. So, and then reminding 106 molecules were annotated as authentic cell surface protein. So basically, we see that a very high percentage of membrane protein uh, proteins, cell surface protein identified there. One important thing is also that concomitantly with us, the Japanese group has used immunohistochemistry, no mass spectrometry, and they have a look into the human tumor tissues using immunohistochemistry, and they, they have found that CD147 and CDCP1 are the proteins that they believe are important as a marker of uh, lung cancers, which is driven with, with KRAS mutants. So from the many aspects we have uh, uh, shown that that approach is definitely something that can be used as an accessory tool in, in a clinical research. So here I will going to end up with my uh, presentation. I would like to acknowledge scientists which are working with me. Uh, the, separation, uh, the separation is done by Dr. Chan uh, Xiao Ying. Uh, she is the one who did all the experiments and data analysis and the RU has helped us a lot with the, um, with the sample preparation. And I would like also to um, acknowledge the RAS initiative uh, leadership, which is uh, of Frank McCormick, Dwight, Dwight Nisley, and uh, Gordon Whiteley. We have also our collaborators from UCLA, NCI, and uh, uh, with that, I'm going to finish my presentation, and I'm ready to take any questions if they are available. Well, thank you, Dr. Blonder, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. 
If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started with our first question of the day. Dr. Blonder, the first question asks, what is LCMS? So that's a good question. Liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So that is a basically a simple thing for people who are not uh, mass spectrometry geeks. That means that uh, mass spectrometer coupled with the liquid chromatography is a pow powerful tool for the analysis of complex biological samples, samples and that is also an antibody-free um, technique. Excellent. Thank you for that information. Uh, the next question asks, what is the what is hydrazide-based glycoproteomics? So the hydrazide-based glycoproteomics is an uh, approach the, uh, that relies really on the oxidation of glycans, turning them into aldehydes, and then covalently binding them to the hydrazide. That allows us to wash out everything that is not covalently bound, and then we use PNG and AZF to release the peptides which are glycosylated. That is a very powerful technique in looking into the uh, glycoproteomics way using glycoproteomics to look into the cell surface protein. Thank you, Dr. Blonder. Uh, let's see. Our next question reads, why is the cell surface proteome important in drug discovery process? So the, the, the major thing uh, that is already everyone most probably knows that, but I would like to reiterate that, that uh, the most of the contemporary drug targets are targeting cell surface. Seventy percent of all drugs which are targeting uh, which are used in the uh, pharmaceutical, uh, in pharmaceutical uh, treatment of the, any kind of disease targets of surface proteins. And uh, there are two reasons why they are important. First is accessibility, because they are on the cell surface. They don't need to be, the molecules that are targeting them don't need to be internalized, number one. And number two, these proteins are basically uh, the molecules that help cells to sense the outer world. So basically, accessibility, and then it can be shut down not only the molecules that cells is sensing its environment, but also the molecules that are helping cells intaking the metabolites, food, and uh, anything important for survival. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, looks as though we are running tight on time. So uh, this will be the last question of uh, the webinar. Uh, this question asks, what is the difference between LC-MS-based proteomics and imaging mass spectrometry? So both of these techniques are using mass spectrometry as a detector. Uh, LC-MS-based doesn't need antibodies because nowadays we do know that is very difficult to find a set of good characterized antibodies. Uh, in, a, in a context of LCMS-based proteomics, antibodies are not needed. Uh, imaging uh, uh, cytometry is a very important, but that can be only applied for a subset of, all, of some of an advanced, uh, advanced known targets. So LCMS is really uh, the prime tool for discovery, and uh, the other one is most probably for cross-validation. They are both very needed and very important, but one need to know distinction between two of those. Excellent. Thank you so much for that answer. I would like to thank you once again, Dr. Blonder, for your presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 12th of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. 
please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon here at LabRoots. Goodbye.